Uh, we have something like four weeks left, including this week. Now this is the 11th week. <coughs> so probably we will be spending something like two weeks on path integrals, and then we can do this band structure. So at least you will have an idea about what we mean by band structure. Okay, now <clears throat> this week we will be starting to study the, the path integrals. So today we have a, a single hour, so I would rather discuss what we are aiming at in evaluating. I mean, what is the object that we will be trying to evaluate using these path integrals? <clears throat> well, I mean, in quantum mechanics most of the time we deal with the wave functions, so, and uh, we don't actually need all the wave functions, but we mainly need some of the information that can be described by the wave function. Wave, wave function uh, just contains everything. So if you know all the wave functions and how your system evolves in time, you can study whatever you want. So if you have an <laughs> initial state, if you know your state in the, uh, at t equal to zero, you can just obtain the your state at, t at a later time by the time evolution operator, which is nothing but your Hamiltonian. And if you want to write down, let's say, the, your wave function at co in coordinate space, this would be x psi of t, which is <coughs> x e to the power minus i over h bar h t psi at t equal to zero. And you can do even one more thing Let's just, let's just write this as the x prime, x e to the power i over h bar, h t, x prime, psi of x prime at t is equal to zero. So if you know this object by some means, you basically know how your system evolves. And you would in fact know everything about your system. So this, let's just call that our g. Now, in the path integral, this is what we will be trying to calculate. Now, of course, then the problem is, okay, this gives us how a given wave function evolves in time, but what else can we extract from this one? How, can, how else can we write this object? Now, let's also look at it, how it evo uh, what kind of a, is there a differential equation that it satisfies? So let's see, let me just take the, uh, of course, this will also have a time dependence. Let's take the time derivative. So this will be equal to x, these are time independent states, <coughs> minus i over h bar h e to the power minus i over h bar h t x prime. Yes, I just inserted identity. This is one. So I just inserted this one over here. So I obtained this my wave function at t equal to zero in coordinate space. And then I have this, what I call the g. Now if I take its time derivative, <coughs> well the Hamiltonian, I can just write the Hamiltonian in coordinate space. It's just replace the momentum operators by this derivative with respect to coordinates and the coordinate operators just are coordinates. So this is minus i over h bar h, again written in coordinate space. <coughs> and then what remains is nothing but my g, x, x prime, and t. And yeah, that's it. So g basically satisfies our Schrodinger equation. Minus or i h bar d by dt acting on g is h g. It's a solution of our Schrodinger equation. 
Now, we can also, if we want to solve a differential equation, we also need the boundary conditions or the initial conditions. So let's look at what the initial conditions are, gx, x prime, at t equal to 0. This is equal to x e to power 0, x prime. But this is nothing but Dirac delta x minus x prime. So we can either directly go and try to calculate this matrix element, uh, that is what we will be doing in path integral formalism. <coughs> or we can just go and try to solve this differential equation with these boundary conditions. So the solution is unique, so we can determine it. Let's also look at some other expressions of it, G, <coughs> what it looks like. X prime, no, X e to the power minus i over h bar h of t x prime, this was our definition. Let's insert some other identity. I can just use the energy basis. Now the nice thing about the energy basis is I know how the Hamiltonian acts on them. Hamiltonian, the action is uh, quite easy. So this becomes sum over x, sum over all these states, e to power minus i over h bar, e n of t, x prime, and n, which is equal to sum over n, e to power minus i over h bar, e n of t, psi n of x, psi n star of x prime. Well, this is nothing but a Fourier series, <coughs> or a Fourier integral, if the spectrum is continuous. And the expansion coefficients are nothing but my wave functions. For example, if you just fix x prime, then psi and star x prime is just a constant, which you can just define as the normalization constant. And then the x-dependent part is your wave function, the eigenstate. So if, if we can somehow determine this g, then we can determine our eigenstates. Let's take the Fourier transform, in a sense. Let's consider this integral, g x x prime t e to the power i over h bar no. e. But let me also add some okay, minus e t dt from minus infinity. Well, let's take from 0 to infinity. It will be basically the same. Now, let's also <coughs> consider the case, just to make sure that the integral converges, let me also add a very small decay. I will eventually take the limit epsilon goes to 0. So this will be equal to, <coughs> let me just use the last expression, from 0 to infinity dt e to the power i over h bar e minus e n. Well, let me also add this i over h bar over there, <coughs> plus i epsilon t sum over n psi n of x psi n star of x prime. If we evaluate this integral, <coughs> that integral just brings a 1 over i over h bar e minus e n plus i epsilon. Let me just call, give this a name, <coughs> x, x prime, e. Well, if you look at this expression, this expression has poles at the energy eigenvalues. So if I can calculate this g, uh, take, go to the uh, energy space, then I will have an analytical function. If I can calculate it analytically, I can find where the poles are. And the poles are at, at the location of the eigenstates, just like the scattering amplitude. 
So if <coughs> once I can obtain this G, I can just solve for the energy eigenvalues. And if I have the energy eigenvalues, the residue is again nothing but my eigenfunctions. So <coughs> if I can calculate this G, I can determine the energy eigenvalues from it. I can determine the energy eigenfunctions from it. <coughs> Let's also discuss one more use of it. Let me take this expression of G. And let me evaluate x, x prime minus i beta <coughs> when t is some imaginary number. OK, t was time to start with. We said it was time. <coughs> but if I can evaluate it analytically, why not put some imaginary number over there? Now, if we put that imaginary number, this just becomes sum over n, h power minus uh, let me also multiply this imaginary number by h bar minus e n times beta psi n of x psi n star of x prime and let me consider this one let me integrate over x g of x x prime evaluate that imaginary time minus i h bar beta this is equal to sum over n e to power minus beta e n dx of psi n of x squared. Well, the eigenstates are normalized. So this will be just 1 e n. <coughs> So is this familiar to you? Let me also take the beta to be this is nothing but your partition function. So you start from a quantum mechanical system. We were discussing its time evolution. And then just if we use the time to be an imaginary number, we just obtain the statistical physics. So we have the quantum st statistics if we just take the time to be an imag purely imaginary number. If you don't want to do <coughs> uh, equilibrium phenomena, in that case, the only thing you need to do is instead of time, take a, no a number that has both the real time and the imaginary part. The imaginary part will be the statistical evolution, and the real part will be the dynamical time evolution of the, your system. So basically, if you can calculate this quantity, you know everything. Now, if you also, <coughs> if, you co if you just put the definition over here, definition of g, th that is nothing but x e to the power minus beta h x this is that integral. But if you look at over here, we have this operator over here, its power minus beta h. We are looking at its diagonal elements, the xx element, and we are just summing over all the x, summing over all the diagonal elements. But this is nothing but the trace of this operator. So that's basically how you also define the partition function in classical physics. Now let's evaluate it for the free particle. So that's probably the easiest system we can think of. So what would you like to use to evaluate it? The free particle? Hmm? Now, I want to evaluate this G. So this is, I want to evaluate for H is equal to P 
squared over 2m minus h bar squared over 2m times the gradient in coordinate space. Well, th we had several means over here. We, we have the dif differential equation. We can proceed that way. Or we, we have written it in terms of the energy eigenstates. OK, once we have the g, we can use, use the g to obtain the, uh, wave, the energy eigenstates and eigenvalues. But if we know the energy eigenstates and eigenvalues, we can use that to obtain g. We can go the other way around, and, or any other method that you can think of. What shall we do? Hmm? Well, let me choose the simple, the easiest one first. This is equal to Let me just insert a moment, a set of momentum against states. This will be equal to dp e to power minus i over h bar p squared over 2m t times xp px prime. This will be equal to dp over 2 pi cube e to power minus i p squared over 2m h bar t 2 pi h bar cube no, it, yeah. e to power i over h bar p x minus x prime What is this wave function? This is e to power i over h bar p pi p x divided by 2 pi h bar to the 3 halves. That's normalization. Now, how do we evaluate this integral? <clears throat> well, at, at least the boundary condition is satisfied. If you put t is equal to 0, we just have the integral of e to the power i over h bar p x minus x prime. That integral just gives, oh, sorry, not 2 pi cubed. We are in, let's say, one dimension. Uh, that just gives a, a Dirac delta. So the, this automatically satisfies the boundary condition. Now, how do we integrate this? Now the problem with this integral that is that it is highly oscillating. So even when p goes to infinity, it just keeps oscillating very fast. So somehow we have to suppress it. For large values of p, it should go to zero. Let me just multiply this first factor minus infinity to infinity dp by 2 pi h bar e to power minus i p squared over 2 m h bar t. Let me multiply this by 1 minus i h bar, mi I minus i epsilon. Epsilon being a slightly positive number. 
So if p goes to infinity, p squared goes to plus zero, plus infinity, so we have a e to the power minus infinity. So it makes sure that my integral converges for large values of p. Eventually, I will take the limit epsilon goes to zero. By the way, this epsilon is exactly the same epsilon that we were considering when we were looking at the scattering problem. If you remember, we had, in that case, we used the boundary conditions to determine how to shift the poles. Times e to the power i over h bar p x minus x prime. <coughs> so this is equal to minus infinity to infinity e p over 2 pi h bar e to the power minus p squared t over 2 m h bar i plus epsilon times e to the power i over h bar p x minus x prime. Now, if you look at this integral, this is the special case of the Gaussian integral, e to the power minus alpha p squared plus beta p. So if you want to evaluate this integral, you just complete the squares, the exponent, e to the power minus alpha p squared minus beta over alpha p plus beta squared over 4 alpha squared minus beta squared over 4 alpha squared. So this just becomes e to the power uh, beta squared over 4 alpha squared uh, 4 alpha times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of, well this is p, e to the power minus alpha p minus beta over 2 alpha everything squared. Now we can just shift the p integral by beta over 2 alpha. What remains is just the ordinary Gaussian integral. And this is e to the power beta squared over 4 alpha square root of pi over alpha. Now I can use this to evaluate my g. So g x, x prime t. Well, I have this overall coefficient. 1 over 2 pi h bar. Then I have the exponent. Now beta, in my case, you see beta is the coefficient of p. In my case, beta is i over h bar x minus x prime. So i squared just gives me minus 1 over h bar squared x minus x prime squared. This is my beta over 4 alpha, alpha is the coefficient of the p squared, 1 over 4, coefficient of p squared is this one. times square root of pi over, again, alpha. This is my g. Let's simplify it a bit. This will be, okay, this 2 pi h bar. I'm sorry. 1 over 2 pi h bar, square root of 2 m h bar over t times pi over there. Well, epsilon, yeah, epsilon is in, uh, if I take the limit, epsilon goes to zero, it just becomes one. If I want to insert it, that is uh, the alpha, so I have to multiply alpha by one plus i epsilon, one i plus epsilon. So we have this i, additional i. i plus epsilon times exponent of x minus x prime squared times 2 
m h bar over 4 h bar squared t i plus epsilon now let's make the simplifications 2 pi h bar I have one left over here h bars cancel, 2's cancel, I have 2 so this is 1 over square root of 2 pi h bar t square root of m over 2 pi h bar t i plus epsilon exponent of m over 2 h bar t i plus epsilon x minus x prime squared so this is rg now beta squared I should have a minus sign over here here there's a minus sign because I have e to power beta squared over 4 alpha beta is this coefficient over here this is our beta this is my beta and this one is my alpha Well, if you just make the substitution, t goes to minus i beta. So g x x here there is a minus sign x x prime minus i h bar beta. This is square root of m over two pi h bar squared beta exponent of minus m x minus x prime squared over 2 h bar squared beta again in the limit as epsilon goes to 0 and this is our partition function for the free particle now in this form it is easier to see that it indeed goes to Dirac delta as beta goes to 0 because you see this expression over here is as a function of x minus x prime this is g uh, this is x minus x prime it's just a Gaussian around x minus x prime equal to zero and the width of this Gaussian is just proportional to beta the integral is independent of beta so if you take the limit as beta goes to zero it just goes to direct out hmm? square root of beta well there are also those h bars and m's etc but if you as you decrease beta well if you decrease beta it's close to t equal to zero it gets narrower and narrower but higher and higher because if you this value at x is equal to zero is also proportional to one over square root of beta um, but that's basically the definition of the Dirac delta is uh, zero with a constant integral function Now the next thing we will do <coughs> is that if you just well if you just look at this uh, this matrix element it's as if here you have a at t equal to zero you have a particle at localized at x prime which evolves 
in time by t. And then the whole thing, this g is nothing but the wave function of that initial state at a later time t. So you start with an initial wave function localized at x prime, and then you let it evolve, and the, your wave function at a later time is nothing but rg. Now, this evolution we don't have to do in a single step. So we can just, we can just start with our wave function, evolve it by, let's say, a small number epsilon. Now, this epsilon can be different from the previous epsilon. Then you evolve it again by epsilon. Where you have, let's say, n of them, such that n times epsilon is equal to t. Now, this is basic, the basic idea of the pattern theory. Now, what we will do is we will just, at every step, let me just define this as x0 the initial one. After evolving by epsilon here, I will just insert a complete basis. The x1, x1, x1. Then here I will insert other ones. So eventually my g will just become like this. I will have all these kind of the x1, the x2, the xn, n minus 1, let me just call this xn, this will be xn if I insert n of them, I'm just inserting n minus 1 identities, product of xi, h power minus i over h bar, h epsilon, xi minus 1, and i starts from 1 up to n. This is my G. So this you can just imagine like, okay, initially I start my particle at x0, then I let it evolve by epsilon, then I look at the, the wave function, the amplitude that it will be at x1. Then I start from x1, multiply that amplitude by the amplitude that if it starts from x1 after evolving by epsilon, it will reach x2. I'm just multiplying all those amplitudes. So basically, for a given value of x1, x2, xn, etc., I have an amplitude, which is the products of the amplitudes. But these x1, x2, xn, etc., I can just interpret them as a path. So this is my time evolution. I start at t equal to 0. My particle is at x prime. At time t is equal to n times epsilon. This is the full evolution. What I do is I just take, divide my time interval into very small pieces. Each one of with epsilon. So at t equal to 0, it's at x, x prime. Then I multiply it with the amplitude that it will be at x1 prime at the time epsilon. Then x2 prime. To obtain one contribution to the amplitude that it will at the time t, it will be at x prime. No, x. Then by summing over the, all these x1, this is x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, etc. By summing over, all, by integrating over all these xi, I'm basically constructing all possible paths. Summing over all paths. So that's why we also call it path integration. Now, of course, up to this point, we didn't really gain anything. We still need to evaluate these matrix elements. Instead of t, we have epsilon. But you see, in the limit as epsilon goes to 0, we can do many approximations. 
if we can actually take the limit at the end that epsilon goes to zero, this, let's say for example, h is equal to p squared over 2m plus v of x. Let's just make this assumption. Now in general, e to the power minus i over h bar h epsilon will not be equal to e to the power minus i over h bar p squared over 2m epsilon times e to the power minus i over h bar v of x times epsilon. They will not be equal because p and x, they do not commute. But you see the error. This is equal to that expression. plus corrections that are of the order of epsilon squared. Not even epsilon, they are of the order of epsilon squared. But this is easier to evaluate, the matrix element of this one it will be easy to evaluate because if you just consider its matrix element acting on the states of definite x, I can just take it out. What remains is nothing but the g for the free particle, which we had already evaluated. Of course, we are doing an error, which is epsilon squared, but epsilon, or errors of the order of epsilon squared will go to zero when we take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. Or we can do it even, we can do a better job. This is equal to e to the power minus i over h bar v over 2 times epsilon e to the power minus i over h bar p squared over 2 m epsilon e to the power minus i over h bar v of x over 2 plus of the order of Now, this time it is epsilon cube. Left hand side and the right hand side are equal up to corrections that, that are of the order of epsilon cube. I mean, if you just Taylor expand all the three exponents on the left and on the right, you will see that they are equal up to terms of the order of epsilon cube. So, for example, if you, for some reason, you cannot take epsilon strictly to zero, but let's say you can make it small then this would be a better approximation. Well, why can't you take it epsilon to zero? Well, for example, if you want to solve this on a, on a, on a computer, well, the computers can take many dimensional integrals. This is a multi-dimensional integral. So you might want to do it on the, on the computer. But of course, then you cannot take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. You can take it small, but it won't be zero. Anyway, on Friday, we will be just pick up from here and just obtain the formal expression for the path integral. Questions? Okay, so see you on Friday.